This is the second lecture on the root locus method. The rules covered in the previous lecture permit us to sketch a root locus rapidly. If we want more detail, we must be able to accurately find important points on the root locus along with their associated gain. Points on the real axis where the root locus enters or leaves the complex plane, or break away or breaking points, and the point where the root locus crosses the imaginary axis are candidates to refine the root locus. We can also derive a better picture of the root locus by finding the angles of departure and arrival from complex poles and zeros respectively. This is what you're going to cover in this lecture. By the end of this lecture, we should be able to extend the concept of a root locus to refine the root locus diagram, understand the application of the root locus method, and apply root locus method to a design problem involving complex poles and zeros. Before we expand the concepts, let's do a quick review of lecture 11. Lecture 11 covered the basics of root locus. Consider the following closed loop system. We have a function g of s that is to be controlled in this unit feedback loop, and we have again k, which is our controller. The objective of the root locus is to find the location of poles as one parameter in the control scheme varies from zero to infinity. In this particular example, the parameter of interest is k. The root locus is simply a picture of the location of all closed loop poles, that is the poles of y of s over r of s, as k goes from zero to infinity. In order to do that, we need to find the characteristic equation of y over r. The closed loop transfer function for this system is simply k times g divided by one plus kg and the characteristic equation is 1 plus k times g. You see that the characteristic equation is a function of the control gain k, and thus by changing k, we are changing the location of poles. Changing the location of poles implies completely changing the time response of the system. We can make a overdamped system become underdamped or even unstable. On the other hand, we can make a unstable open loop function become closed loop stable by properly tuning the parameter k. To analyze the influence of a given parameter of interest, in this case k, but it could be any parameter in the system, including parameters of the transfer function itself, the characteristic equation of the closed loop system must be in the format 1 plus k times h equals to 0. k is a parameter of interest and h is a function of s. h of s can be written as a ratio of two polynomials, p over q of s, and this can now be replaced into the characteristic equation. The characteristic equation can be rearranged as q of s plus k times p of s equals to zero. And when k tends to zero, this term tends to zero, and the poles of the transfer function satisfy q of s equals to zero. The roots of q of s equals to zero represent the roots of the characteristic equation when k equals to zero, and also the poles of the closed loop transfer function y over r. We can also rearrange this expression by simply dividing everything by k. In this case, the expression rewrites as follows. Now when k tends to infinity, we see that this term tends to 0, and the solutions to 4 are simply p of s equals to 0. Now the roots of p of s are the roots of the characteristic equation when k tends to infinity, and these represent the poles of the closed loop transfer function r over y. Formally defined, the root locus is the set of values of s for which 1 plus k times h equals to 0 is satisfied as the real parameter k varies from 0 to infinity. And as we saw in the previous lecture, the root locus will start at the zeros that is q of s equals to 0 and will migrate towards p of s equals to 0, that is the zeros of the characteristic equation. Now if we go back to the example we started with, we have a open loop transfer function g of s, and you can now assess the stability of the closed loop system by simply looking at the location of poles and zeros of g of s, and we know now that the closed loop poles will go from the poles of g of s towards the zeros of g of s. And this, as you can see, is a very powerful tool to design a control system. We take the open loop transfer function, and you can tell how the closed loop transfer function will behave. Of course, this is only valid when we have a unit feedback loop and the parameter k is explicitly given in the loop like that. However, if this parameter is in the transfer function, then you have to rearrange the characteristic equation in this format for root locus analysis. The root locus is now a set of points that satisfy 1 plus q times h of s, or g of s, as we used in the previous lecture, equal to 0. This implies that a q times h of s must be equal to negative 1. We are dealing with a complex function. Negative 1 means that if you place this point in the imaginary plane, it will be placed here. 
which means that the angle this vector forms with the real axis is 180 degrees and the magnitude of the transfer function h of s is 1. In order for a point s to be part of the root locus, the magnitude of the transfer function at s must be equal to 1 and the angle of the transfer function at that specific value of s must be 180 degrees. To calculate the magnitude of the transfer function, we can simply calculate the magnitude of all zeros, multiply them together, and divide it by the multiplication of all poles. For this generic example, the magnitude of all poles and zeros are simply the distance that separates them from the origin of the imaginary plane, and the angle is the angle they form with the real axis. The magnitude of the entire transfer function is simply the ratio of the magnitude of zeros divided by the magnitude of poles. If this distance here is called a and this distance is called b, then the magnitude of the entire transfer function is simply a over b. Should they have more poles than zeros, simply multiply the magnitude of all zeros and the magnitude of all poles and this gives the magnitude of the function g of s or h of s. The phase or angle requirement of g of s is simply the sum of the angle of all zeros minus the sum of angles of all poles. In this case, the angle of the zero is theta one and, this, and the angle of the pole is theta two. So theta one minus theta two is the angle of G of S. If we have more poles and more zero, simply add all zeros, subtract all poles, and this is the angle of the function. We can mathematically define it as given here. And this must be odd multiples of 180 degrees to satisfy the angle requirement. The angle of the transfer function must be odd multiples of 180 degrees. Let's do an example to recall what we did in the last lecture. Sketch the root locus of the closed loop system as k varies from 0 to infinity. k is a parameter in the transfer function. It could be a parameter that represents mass or friction or a spring constant in a mechanical system that you have to design. The first step is to find the closed loop transfer function. As I've seen before, the closed loop transfer function is simply the multiplication of the line functions divided by 1 plus the multiplication of the line functions. Let's call it here t of s. Now we need to prepare the characteristic equation as 1 plus k times h, where h is a function of s. Here is our characteristic equation, 1 plus s plus 1, s plus 2, s plus k equals to 0. This can be expanded as s plus 2 times s plus k plus s plus 1 equals to 0. Expanding this equation gives s squared plus s times 2 plus k plus 2k plus s plus 1 equals to 0. Now let's group all elements with k and elements that don't have k. This gives s squared plus what multiplies s is 2s plus s that is 3s plus 1. These are the elements without k and plus k times s plus 2 equals to 0. These are the non-k elements, these are the k elements. And now if you look at the characteristic equation we need, we need 1 plus k times g of s equals to 0. To make that a 1 appear, we can divide the entire function by the non-k element. Dividing everything by s squared plus 3s plus 1 gives 1 plus k times s plus 2 divided by s squared plus 3s plus 1 equals to 0. And this is the characteristic equation in the form needed for root locus analysis. Now we can find the zeros and the poles of the transfer function. The zero is s equals to negative 2, and the poles are s equals to negative 2.618 and s equals to negative 0.382. In the next step, we locate the poles and zeros of h of s in the s plane. Here we have the pole, the zero, and the other pole. Now the root locus exists to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros. If you recall from lecture 11, this means that uh, the root locus in this case exists between the zero and the pole at negative 3.82 and to the left of negative 2.81. We see an excess of one pole. When you have an excess of one pole, we have an asymptote going to negative infinity following an angle of negative 180 degrees. We can conclude now that this pole goes to that zero and this pole goes to negative infinity and is the one using the asymptote at 180 degrees. What can we conclude? Looking at this root locus, what can be said about the time response of the closed loop system y over r of s? We can say that the system is always overdamped because the roots of the characteristic equation or the poles of the closed loop transfer function are always real numbers. We can also say that the system is always stable regardless of the value of k so long as k is greater than zero. This can be said because the poles never cross into the unstable region 
of the S-plane. In the next example, let's find the root locus for a system whose characteristic equation is given here. The characteristic equation is already given. This will have complex poles. We have a 0 at negative 1 and the 3 poles, 2 of which are complex conjugate numbers. This characteristic equation has 2 more poles than zeros, n minus m equals 2. This means that we have two asymptotes going to infinity. The asymptotes will have angles that are, can now be calculated through this formula, where n minus m is the number of excess of poles or zeros, and q in this case will be 1 and 2. When q equals to 1, we'll find an asymptote at 90 degrees. When q equals to 2, we'll find an asymptote at negative 90 degrees. The centroid of the asymptote now is sum of all poles, negative 0 0.36 minus 0 0.32 minus 0 0.32 minus the sum of all zeros, which in this case is simply negative 1, divided by n minus m, that is 2. And this turns out to be 0. The centroid is at 0 on the real axis. Now notice here that there is no need to include the imaginary part of complex poles, because they always appear in conjugate numbers, which means that 1.63j minus 1.63j is going to be 0. So it is sufficient to only write the real part of complex poles. The centroid of the asymptotes is then at 0, which is here. One goes up at an angle of 90 degrees, the other one goes down at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Where is the root locus? The root locus is to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros. Let's now expand that rule a little bit and reformulate that rule as the root locus exists to the left of an odd number of real poles and the real zero. Complex poles, in this case, are always coming in pairs, so they will not influence the count. So the number of real poles and zeros here is 0, 1, and 2. The root locus only exists on the real axis between this pole and this zero, so the pole must go to the zero. The other two poles are the ones that are going to use the 90 degree asymptotes. One of them goes up, the other one goes down, and this is now the root locus of the closed loop system as k varies from zero to infinity. What can we conclude by looking at this root locus? First, we can say that the system is always underdamped. Why is that? Because you always have complex conjugate poles. What else can we say? The system appears to be always stable because the poles never cross into the unstable part of the S-plane. However, they tend to be very close to the imaginary axis. So as k tends to infinity, the system is tending to a marginally stable system. Now we are going to develop more tools to refine the root locus. The first one is the breakaway or breaking point. We have seen many examples where real poles break away from the real axis and become complex conjugate numbers. And you have also seen examples where complex poles become real poles. The points where the poles leave the real axis are called the breakaway points and the points where they become again real numbers are called break-in points. Let's look at this particular example. If you draw the root locus for this system, we should see something like this. These two poles come together and go toward zeros. One goes up, the other one goes down, and each one goes to one of the zeros. This is happening as k goes from zero to infinity. As the two closed loop poles move towards each other, the gain increases from a value of zero. We conclude that the gain must be maximum along the real axis at the point where the breakaway occurs. Naturally, the gain increases above this value as the pole moves into the complex plane. But the maximum gain that results in real poles is the point where these poles will break away from the real axis. We conclude that the breakaway point occurs at a point of maximum gain on the real axis between the open loop poles. Now let's turn our attention to the break-in points somewhere between the two zeros. When the closed loop complex pair returns to the real axis, the gain will continue to increase to infinity as the closed loop poles move towards the open loop zero. It must be true then that the gain at the break-in points is the minimum gain found along the real axis between the two zeros. The question now is how do we find these maximum and minimum values of k? To do that, we need to, to do that, we can set k to a function called p of s and rearrange the equation 8, which is the characteristic equation in the standard form for root locus. When k equals to p of s, we can rearrange 8 as negative p over q, which is the expression basically for k. How do we find the maximum value of k, or the maximum or minimum of a function? Simply take the derivative of p of s with respect to s, and set that to zero. This will give points 
as functions of s where the value of k is the maximum and minimum along the real axis. If you take this example with two real poles, we know that these poles will meet somewhere between them and then break away. We now know that the value of k is 0 here and here and will increase as the poles come together and eventually break away. The maximum value of k occurs at the breakaway point along the real axis. If you now plot p of s as a function of the real parts of s, we should see this curve, which suggests suggests that the breakaway point is halfway between the poles. This is the pole at negative 4, this is the pole at negative 2. The maximum of the function has a slope of 0, which means that the derivative of k with respect to s, or in this case p of s with respect to s, must be 0 at the breakaway point. Let's do a numerical example. Find the breakaway point for this characteristic equation. If we set k to p of s and I'll solve for p of s in this equation, we have 1 plus p of s times 1 over s plus 2 times s plus 4 equals to 0. Move minus 1 to the other side and multiply minus 1 with s plus 2 and s plus 4 and we get this expression. This results in negative s squared plus 6s plus 8 and you can now take the derivative of p of s with respect to s and set that to 0. This is going to be 2s plus 6, or negative 2s and minus 6. Solving for s gives s equals to negative 3. s equals to negative 3 is the point where these poles break away from the imaginary axis and become complex conjugate numbers. Now notice that this is the value of s, this is the value on the real axis where this occurs. Now what is the value of k at the breakaway point? To find that, let's go back to this equation here, which is equation for p of s which is k, and this is negative s plus 2 times s plus 4. If we now evaluate p at negative 3 at the breakaway point, this is the value of k at that point, and this is negative negative 3 plus 2 times negative 3 plus 4, which gives k equals to 1. So at this point, k equals to 0, k equals to 0, k starts to increase, and when k is equal to 1, we will be at s equals to negative 3 at the breakaway point. And if k is now greater than 1, the poles become complex conjugate poles. And now the system goes from being an overdamped system to a underdamped system. For k greater than 0 and smaller than 1, we have an overdamped system because the poles are real numbers. k equals to 1, we have a critically damped system because we now have two poles at the same location at negative 3. And when k is greater than 1, the system now becomes under them. Another point of interest when drawing the root locus is to find the maximum value of k before the system becomes unstable or the point where the root locus crosses the imaginary axis. This indicates the maximum gain k before instability. How do we find the maximum gain before instability? Well, to do that, we can simply use the Ralph Hurwitz stability criterion that we covered in one of our past lectures. Assume that you have a characteristic equation 1 plus k divided by s plus 1 times s plus 2 times s plus 3. This is the characteristic equation of a function that can be rearranged as follows. This characteristic equation can now be evaluated for stability using the Ralph Hurwitz array. Simply fill out the array using the methods we studied earlier and now solve for the values of k that will give an entire row of zero. In this example, we can see here that when k equals to 60, we have an entire row of zeros, which suggests that the poles are located on the imaginary axis. We also have k equals to negative 6 that would satisfy that criterion. However, remember that the root locus goes from 0 to plus infinity, so only positive values of k are considered. When k equals to 60, we have a row of zeros, and the poles now lie on the imaginary axis. If you draw the root locus for this system here, this pole goes to negative infinity. These two poles will come together and go towards infinity following asymptotes of plus minus 60 degrees. At this specific two points, we know the value of k, that is 60, because this is the value of k that it gives a row of zeros in the Routh Hurwitz stability criterion. Let's assume hypothetically that the value of k at the breakaway point is k equals to k1 and occurs right there. What can we say about this system? When k equals to 0, the poles are here, here, and here. And as k increases, the poles will come together, reach the breakaway point, and become complex conjugate numbers. The value of k at that point is k1. It's a hypothetical value. We can now say that if k is greater than 0, 
and is smaller than k1, the system is overdamped. This is because all poles are real numbers. When k equals to k1, the system is critically damped because now two of the poles are the same. When k is now greater than k1 but is smaller than 60, the system is underdamped because now the poles are complex conjugate numbers. When k equals to 60, the system is undamped. The poles lie on the imaginary axis. The system is marginally stable. And when k is greater than 60, now we are to the right of the imaginary axis and the system is unstable. This gives a good example of, of application of the root locus method. With one snapshot of the system, we can tell exactly how it is going to behave in the time domain. Now let's further refine our sketch of the root locus by finding angles of departure and arrival from complex poles and zeros. Consider this example here. To make it a bit more interesting, I'm going to change this pole with the zero. We know that if a point is part of the root locus, the angle of the transfer function at that point must be 180 degrees. If you take the sum of the angle of all poles and subtract the angle of all zeros, these must be odd multiples of 180 degrees. Let's call this angle theta1 this angle theta 2 and this angle theta 3. The sum of the angle of all zeros minus the sum of angles of all poles must be equal to odd multiples of 180 degrees. For this particular example, we have theta 1 minus theta 2 minus theta 3 equals to 180 degrees plus L times 360 where L is an integer to account for the fact that this sum can be also odd multiples of 180 degrees. We can rewrite this expression simply by stating the sum of angles of zeros minus the sum of angles of poles equals to 180 degrees, where psi is the angle from a point to a zero and phi is the angle from a point to a pole. This holds for all poles and zeros, but we could also take any point as reference. In this example, we took the origin of the s-plane as a reference, but this could be done with respect to any point on the s-plane. If you pick this point, for example, we can also trace lines from that point to all poles and zeros. And the same relation now applies. If point P here belongs to the root locus, then the sum of angles from this point to all poles and zeros must be 180 degrees. For this particular case, we have theta 1 minus theta 2 minus theta 3 minus theta 4. This must be equal to 180 degrees or odd multiples of 180 degrees. Theta 1 is the angle between the point and the zero, and these three are the angle between the point and the poles. For any point on the plane, we can now expand this expression as follows, where q phi is the angle of that point that must be included so that the the sum adds up to 180 degrees. Let's look at an example here. This will help us find in which direction one pole moves on the root locus, and that is the, in this case, the departure angle from a pole. The way we are going to proceed is to specify this reference point P very close to the point where we want to find the departure angle. In this case, you're interested in the departure angle of pole P1. Our reference point P is very close to P1. We can now trace lines from that point to all poles and zeros. We can now define an angle here, theta, and you can also define the angle between the reference point and pole P2. Because P and P1 are very close, then this angle must be 90 degrees. Theta can also be calculated. Because P and P1 are very close, we can define theta by simply looking at this angle, which in this case is 45 degrees. We see that we have negative 4 and 4, so the angle here is 45 degrees. Theta is 180 degrees minus 45 degrees, which is 135 degrees. The angle here is the angle we are looking for. This is d phi. We can now say that d phi, we can now use the formula sum of angle of zeros minus sum of angles of poles equals to 180 degrees. Sum of angles of zeros, this is zero, and we have three angles for poles. That is d phi, negative 90 degrees, and negative 135 degrees. We can now, and this must be 180 degrees. d phi is zero minus 90 degrees minus 135 degrees minus 180. Here we find the elements sum of zero, 
sum of poles and minus 180. If we add this up, we'll see that this will be greater than 360 degrees. So to make things easier, we can now use this term and simply assign an integer to L, in this case negative 1, times 360, and this will give d phi as negative 45 degrees. This is of course just an explanation how this expression was derived, but we can't simply use this expression directly. Sum of angle of all zero, zero, sum of angle of all poles, negative 90 degrees, plus 135, minus 180, minus negative 1 times 360, negative 45 degrees. This is d phi. This is now the angle of a point here, and this point satisfies the angle requirement and thus is part of the root locus. This indicates that P1 is moving in that direction with an angle of negative 45 degrees. This is the departure angle of pole P1. If P1 is going down by 45 degrees, then P2 is going up by 45 degrees because you remember the root locus is always symmetric with respect to the real axis. Now let's draw the root locus. This pole at negative 4 does not exist, just neglect it. What do we get here? We have three poles and no zeros. So you have three asymptotes going to infinity at angles of negative 60, 60, and 180 degrees. Hypothetically, let's assume that this is the centroid. One goes up, one goes down, and one goes to negative infinity. 60 degrees, negative 60 degrees. We only have one real pole, which means that the root locus needs to be to the right of that real pole, this pole goes to negative infinity, is the one that uses the 180 degree asymptote. The other two poles now use the 60 and negative 60 degree asymptote, and they depart at an angle of 45 degrees. This pole goes this way, this pole goes that way, and they have a departure angle of negative 45 degrees and plus 45 degrees. The same approach can be used to determine the angle of arrivals of a branch at zero. We are concerned with the arrival at this zero. So we can leave the zero out of the equation and then solve for the value of the angle at that zero that will satisfy the angle requirement. It started by tracing lines from the reference point to all poles and zeros. This angle is theta one. This angle is theta two, which is ac actually negative theta one. The angle between this line and the zero is zero degrees, and the angle between this line and the other zero is also zero degrees. We can now use the formula to find the arrival angle at that zero. Sum of the angle between the lines and all poles, that is theta one plus theta two, which is negative theta one plus zero, minus the sum of all angles from that point to all zeros, which is zero plus 180 degrees. The arrival angle is 180 degrees. We can now sketch the root locus. For this particular root locus, we see that this pole goes to that zero, and this pole will have to come to the imaginary axis. And because there is nothing between this zero and that pole, the complex pole will have to become real poles, like that. One goes to negative infinity, one goes to the zero, and we'll arrive at that zero at an angle of 180 degrees. Now we have all tools we need to sketch good root locus. Let's review them. Rule number one states that as k varies from zero to infinity, there are n lines in the root locus where n is the degree of q or p, whichever is greater. Rule number two states that as k varies from zero to infinity, the roots of the characteristic equation move from the poles to the zeros of h of s. Again, our characteristic equation is in the form of 1 plus q times h of s equals to 0. The root locus must be symmetrical with respect to the horizontal axis. A root locus cannot cross its own path. On the real axis, the root locus is always to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros that align on the real axis. Rule number 6. Lines leave, break out, and enter, break in the real axis at a 90 degree angle. Rule number 7 states that if there is a different number of poles and zeros, extra lines that do not have a pair go or come from infinity. Rule number 8 is an extension of rule number 7 and it specifies the angle of these lines that go or come from infinity. The angle of the asymptotes of the curves that go to infinity is given in equation 13 and they radiate out of the real axis at a certain point. This point is called alpha, the centroid of this asymptote. Rule number 9 says if there is at least two lines that go to infinity, then the sum of all the roots is constant. 
And rule number 10 states that if the gain sweeps from zero to negative infinity as opposed to plus infinity, the root locus can be drawn by reversing rule 5, which means that now poles and zeros are to the left of an even number of poles and zeros, or to the right of an odd number of poles and zeros, and by adding 180 degrees to the asymptote angles. We can now use all these rules to get a very good approximation of the real root locus. We can now define a series of steps that will help us draw the root locus. First, prepare the characteristic equation in the form of 1 plus k times h equals to 0, and factor the m poles and n zeros. This will give the explicit location of poles and zeros as in equation 16. In step 2, locate the poles of zeros of h of s, here is h of s, in the s plane. In step number 3, locate the segments of the real axis that contain a root locus. They are always to the left of an odd number of poles and zeros. In this case, the root locus is between this pole and this zero, and to the left of that zero, which means that this pole will break in here, this pole will break in there, one goes to negative infinity and one goes to the zero. In step 4, now calculate the angle and the centroid of any asymptotes that are part of the root locus. In step 5, if applicable, determine the points at which the root locus crosses the imaginary axis. To do that, simply use the Routh Hurwitz stability criterion. If applicable, in step 6, determine the breakaway point on the real axis. Set k equals to p of s, solve for p of s, and take the derivative of p of s, set that to 0, and solve for the values of s. That will give the value of s at the breakaway point. If the value of s here is s1, then now evaluate p at s1, to find the value of k at the breakaway point. Now notice here, a ver there is a lot of confusion between the breakaway point and the centroid of the asymptote. They are not the same. Always consider that they are not the same. In some specific cases they are, as in this example here, where most of the time the centroid of the asymptotes and the breakaway or breaking point are never at the same point. In step 7, if applicable, determine the angle of departure from a complex pole or the angle of arrival at a complex pole. With all this information gathered, you can proceed to step 8 and complete the root locus. You can then check your results using the MATLAB function rlocus h, where h is a function of s. Now it's time to attempt a few more exercises. I recommend you try them on your own first, and if you cannot find a solution, then watch the videos or watch the videos to confirm your answers. But do attempt each of these exercises on your own first. Thank you.